Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our weekly Thursday night shear. The shear is Lo'ilo Nishmas Daniela Sheina Aleha HaShalom Bas Yeshua Falik Meher Neshoma Heaven Aliyah Ala Yidin Ayeshia The Kranka Arafia, the Gazinta Ayeshia All Jews should have brachas and simchas and many simchas. It should be often and soon. Tonight we're going to start studying together a little bit about Hanukkah. The first night of Hanukkah, of course, is exactly in one week from tonight, next week, Thursday evening. Um, there are many insights and there are many beautiful ideas surrounding this Yom Tov of light and of warmth, and we will get, uh, we will get right to it. Um, over the next couple of weeks, definitely, we'll discuss some insights from the Yom Tov of Hanukkah. There is actually no tractate, there is no Masechda designated specifically to the Yom Tov of Hanukkah. And the reason for that is, is not for this, not for tonight's discussion. Uh, just suffice it to say that the rabbis had a complicated relationship with the heroes of the story of Hanukkah. The heroes of the story of Hanukkah are, of course, the Hashmanoim, the Hashmanoi family, the family of Kohanim Gedolim, um, who lead the war, who lead the Jews to war um, against the Roman Greeks, are miraculously victorious. They restore the base of Mikdash, as, as we're going to learn, please God, tonight. Um, and, uh, and really, you know, they are the, the, the knights in shining armor uh, in the days of Hanukkah. However, the family, um, after, after the story of Hanukkah, assert and position themselves as monarchs, as kings over the Jewish nation. Um, and they gradually, from generation to generation, their level, of, their level of spirituality declines, um, their, level, their level of morality declines. And it gets to a point where approximately 200 years after the story of Hanukkah, the Hashmanoi family, because of some inner strife among the descendants of the Hashmanoi themselves, uh, they invite the Romans to come to Eretz Yisrael, to come to Yerushalayim, to come and help uh, orchestrate and arbitrate peace agreements between the Hashmanoi monarchs, um, and once the Romans were invited into Eretz Yisrael and into Yerushalayim, they never left, and from there, the Churban, the destruction of the Beis HaMikdosh, ensued not much longer after that. So, in, in short, the rabbis appreciated um, the Hashmanoi the Hashmanoi family's contribution to the story of Hanukkah, but not much after that, and so that is the primary reason why in the Mishnah and in the Gemara there isn't one tractate designated completely uh, to the story of Hanukkah, as there is for every other Yom Tov, um, in, even including Purim. But nevertheless, the Gemara spares no effort and no detail um, in telling us how to celebrate Hanukkah and why we celebrate Hanukkah and giving us much of the fanfare and excitement and beauty of the Yom Tov, etc., um, some of which we'll discuss tonight. Most of the, most of the material on the Yom Tov of Hanukkah is given to us in a tractate called Masech the Shabbos, um, where over there in the, in, in the discussion, uh, actually taken from a parak in Masech the Shabbos called Bamem Adlikin, which many Jews say on Friday night, over there in the discussion about Shabbos candles, the Gemara enters into the, Shab the discussion about Hanukkah candles, and from there tells us the story and the history and shares with us many laws that are relevant for the Yom Tov of Hanukkah. Tonight, I'm going to read just a couple of lines from the Gemara. Again, this is from the Gemara in Masech the Shabbos, Tafchaf Aleph on the Bay. It's very famous, um, but there's, there's some beautiful insights which are shared here, some of which we'll go through tonight. All right, says the Gemara, my Hanukkah. What is the uniqueness or what is the specialty? Or what, is, what is Hanukkah, really? The Toner Rabban and the rabbis taught Bechafei Bekislev beginning on the 25th day of Kislev, again this year, that is next week, Thursday night. Yoimur the Hanukkah Tamya Inun. There are eight days of Hanukkah. The Loyal Mispad behind it is forbidden to eulogize on those days because eulogies often invoke sadness and melancholy and Hanukkah is, are, is Hanukkah supposed to be eight days of celebration. With the Loyal Hisanas behind it is forbidden to fast during these eight days of Hanukkah because fasting, once again, for Jews is associated with sadness and pain. And these eight days are supposed to be days of celebration and Yom Tov. Why? Why are we so excited? Why, where did this Yom Tov come from? Says the Gemara, 
because when the Greeks entered the temple, again, this is the story of Hanukkah, takes place about 200 years before the destruction of the second base of Mikdash. The second base of Mikdash stands for about 200, to for 420 years, about halfway through. So when the Greeks entered the temple, Timu Kol Hashmanim Shebehechel, the Gemara says, they defiled all of the oils that were in the temple. They didn't destroy them. They didn't pour them out. They defiled them. They were metame them. Ukshegovro malchus beis chashmenoi, and when the chashmenoi family led the Jews to war and were victorious over the Greeks, the Natsum, and were victorious over them, Bodku, they searched in the temple, they searched in the base of Mikdash, they only found one jug of oil. That was still lying there, sealed with the seal of the coin Godel, sealed in the type of jug that could not be defiled unless the seal was broken, and the seal was not broken, so they found one jug of pure olive oil, still with the signet ring, still with the stamp of the coin Godel, that this jug of oil was pure. But there was only enough oil to last for one day. A miracle happened. And they, burnt, they used it to light the menorah for eight days. The following year, the rabbis made these eight days, that is from the 25th of Kislev, the first day, and eight days after that, they made them a yomtif. Bahalal Halal is said, Hoidoa, we give thanks and acknowledgement to Hashem for this incredible miracle. This is, this is the Gemara's background and the story of Hanukkah. Now, what's the significance of eight days? So the rabbis explain that it took eight days for them to prepare new olive oil that would be pure, that would have the same level uh, halachically of purification as this jug of olive oil that they found here. All right, why did it take eight days? Either because they had to journey for a couple of days and come back, or because it took them seven days to purify themselves, and then on the eighth day they squeezed the olives, be it as it made different explanations. They needed eight days in order to obtain new pure olive oil, and so Hashem made a miracle, and this one little jug of oil that they found um, lasted for eight days. And so this becomes, this gave us the Yom Tov of Hanukkah that we've been celebrating for more than 2,000 years since then. Every year, for eight nights, we celebrate and we light the menorah, etc. All right, this, this, is, this is the way the Gemara explains it. One of the most famous questions that are asked with regard to the Yom Tov of Hanukkah is that it seems that it seems that the miraculous element of the Yom Tov is only seven days, not eight days. After all, the fact that the, the oil lasted for eight days um, was not entirely miraculous. One of those days was within the framework of nature. They did have enough oil to last for one day. The miracle happened and it stretched seven days more than necessary. So one day it burned according to nature. The other seven was a miracle. So the question, it's one of the most famous questions that are asked about the Yom Tov of Hanukkah. The question is, it seems like a seven-day miracle, not an eight-day miracle. So why do we celebrate? Why do we acknowledge? Why do we give thanks to Hashem for a miracle of eight days? It's not a miracle of eight days. The miracle is seven days. It should be a seven-day Yom Tov. All right. It doesn't seem like a terribly difficult question. Which Jew ever complained about one more day of celebration? But the rabbis gave tremendous amount of attention and focus on this question. Why is the Yom Tov of Hanukkah eight days and not seven days? If the miracle only extended the life of the lights and of the oil for seven days, not by eight days, because one day was natural. The oil was enough, even without any miracle, for the candles to last for eight days. There are many, many answers that are given to this question. Um, one of which, by the way, is, is actually um, the most 
the most fitting with the words of the Gemara itself, um, one of which says that what happened was when they found this one jug of oil, they knew that they needed it to last for eight days. They knew from the beginning that they needed it to last for eight days. So instead of pouring all the oil into the menorah on the first day, they divided it into eight, and on each day, they poured only an eighth of the jug of oil into the menorah. And a miracle happened, that although under normal circumstances you needed the entire jug for the, men for the menorah to burn for, for that day, the menorah burned for an entire day, each one of those eight days, on an eighth of a jug. Because again, they knew ahead of time that they were going to, it was going to take them eight days until they would get the oil. So they divided it up and, uh, and, and they only put in an eighth of the contents of the jug into the menorah each day. That's one of the explanations. Another explanation along similar lines was that, was that when they poured the oil into the menorah on the first day of Hanukkah, even if, the, even according to this, even if they poured all the oil in, when they removed the jug, the jug was still full. So in every one of the days of Hanukkah, they poured from the jug, that, from the jug of oil that they had found, from the pure jug, into the menorah. But the jug never got empty. As soon as they pulled it away, uh, the jug of oil was still full. So for this reason, it's considered an eight-day miracle, because even on the first day of Hanukkah, already on the first day of Hanukkah, even as they filled the menorah with this pure jug of oil, when they removed the jug, the jug wasn't lacking any oil, so already then there was a miracle for, for, the, for the Yom Kippur of Hanukkah. All right. Again, many, many other explanations, but these are the, this, this is the general discussion. Tonight, I want to share with you three more explanations, again, to answer this question. Why is the Yom Tov of Hanukkah an eight-day miracle, not a seven-day miracle, um, if the miracle only extended the life of the oil by seven days? Three explanations. Number one, many rabbis say that on the first day of Hanukkah, we celebrate the military victory of the Jews. Now, let me try to explain just very briefly what, what, what that means. What they're really saying, again, in this particular, every answer has its own thought, every answer has its own pattern, every answer is its own world. But in this answer, what they're saying is that actually, if you think about it, if you take a step back, in the Hanukkah, we really are celebrating two miracles. There are actually two things that happen over the, that we commemorate in the Yom Tov of Hanukkah. One is the one that Gemara is talking about over here, the very famous one. The fact that the candles should have lasted one day, but a miracle happened and they lasted eight days. Okay. But the Gemara seems to gloss over the other miracle that took place, and that was the military victory of the Jews against the Greek army. You're talking about the Greek army was the superpower of the time. Compared to the Jewish army, this would be like an ant waging war against an elephant. Within the framework of nature, there was no way possible that the Jewish army, skilled as they were, and dedicated as they were, and ready to risk their lives as they were, there was no way within the framework of nature that an army that small and, and that weak could defeat or fight off the Greek army. And yet, as we say in the, in the Va'al Hanissim prayer over Hanukkah, Hashem made a tremendous miracle. Giboyrim biyad chaloshim, handed over the mighty Greek warriors in the hand of the Jews who were physically weak, weaker than them. Rabbim biyad ma'atim, so many Greek soldiers in the hands of so few Jews. If you think about it, it's an amazing miracle. That's the miracle that we celebrate in the first day of Hanukkah. So yes, this answer says it's true. You're right. The miracle of the oil is actually only seven days. One out of the eight days was, was natural. Why do we make it into an eight-day miracle? Because one of the days of Hanukkah, we celebrate the miracle of the military victory, the fact that the Jews were able to chase away a mighty army like that. That itself deserves a yomtif of one day. 
What's interesting about that answer is that by logic, if you think about it, it should be the other way around, right? We should give a seven-day Yom Tov for the military victory and a one-day Yom Tov for the miracle of the oil. I mean, the miracle of the oil is very nice. The oil should have lasted one day. It lasted eight days. No, we say the Mazel Tov, but that's just, it's just a jug of oil. The miracle of the, of the victory of the Jews, you're talking about how many thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Jewish lives were saved because of this military victory. The extent of the miracle seems, seems much greater than the miracle of the oil. All right, again, the rabbis saw the miracle, this, this military victory, they saw that as something temporary. Again, within 200 years, unfortunately, the second base of Mikdash was destroyed and Jews were sent into Golos once again. So the impact of that miracle, of the military victory, was two centuries, which is, com which is relatively short, compared to the miracle of the oil, which we still celebrate till this day, 2,000 years later. But still, at least one day of Hanukkah can be dedicated to the miracle of the military victory. And so this is one, one explanation why we celebrate eight days. You know, one of the days, the first, the 25th day of Kislev, we celebrate the amazing miracle that Hashem did for the Jewish army at the times of Hanukkah, where they drove away, and they, the ultimate David versus Goliath story, where they drove away an army that was so much more powerful and so much stronger by the, by the grace of Hashem, by the miracle of Hashem. For the, again, for this reason, it's an eight-day Yom Tov. That's answer number one. Next, answer number two, the rabbis give an ingenious explanation. They say, no, forget about the military victory. That's a separate discussion. That's not being commemorated here as one of the, as one of the eight days of Hanukkah. The Gemara at this part, at least at this point, makes no mention of it. So why do we celebrate eight days of Hanukkah if the miracle was only seven? I'll tell you why the rabbis said. Because if you gloss over the Gomorrah too quickly, you can miss this. But there was another miracle. Besides for the miracle that the jug of oil lasted for eight days, rather than one day, besides for that, there was a miracle. You know what the miracle was? That they found a jug of oil. That they even found a jug of oil, that in itself was a miracle. After all the Greeks had done to defile the Beis HaMikdash. After all the Greeks had done specifically to defile the oil, they had some obsession with the defamation of oil. After all the Greeks had done, of course, in the spiritual sense, this represents that the Greeks were trying to spiritually pervert the, 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 the spiritual holiness of the Jews. After all the Jews had been through, they found one jug of pure olive oil and it still had the seal of the high priest. Ah, that's a miracle. Even before you put it in the menorah, even before we know how long it's going to last, even if this jug of oil would only have lasted one day, just the fact that they found it, this itself is a miracle. This itself is worthy of celebration, and for this itself, there is one of the eight days of Yom Tov of Hanukkah to commemorate and to celebrate the fact that they found this particular jug of oil. In fact, the rabbis say, if you, again, if you pay attention to the words of the Talmud, you can see that this was not just stam, this was not just stam a miracle. This was an incredible miracle. The fact that they found the jug of oil. Why do we say it's such an incredible miracle? Because actually, the wording of the Talmud is that when the Greeks went into the temple, quote, Tim kol hashmanim they defiled all the oil in the Beis HaMikdash. Wait a second, say the rabbis. What do you mean they defiled all the oil in the Beis HaMikdash? They didn't defile all the oil in the Beis HaMikdash. The proof is that later when the Hashmanoim came, they searched and they found one jug that wasn't defiled. So they thought they defiled all the oil, or they tried to defile all the oil, or they defiled all of the oil that they could find, that they knew, that they saw, etc. But clearly they didn't defile all the oil. One jug was salvaged. 
the commentaries say that this particular jug of oil was hidden in the floorboards of the Beis Hamikdash. And the Greeks missed it and they searched everywhere to try to defile every last jug. And, 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 and there was one jug that escaped them. Or according to other opinions, they, Hashem miraculously placed that jug of oil there in the base of Mikdosh, even after the Greeks defiled all the oil. But be it as it may, the point here is that the Greeks made a concentrated effort not to leave anything behind. In the words of the Gemara, they defiled it all. And yet, amazingly, miraculously, the Jews found one jug of oil that had not been defiled, that still held the seal of the high priest of the Kohen Godel. Ah, that's a miracle. That's even before we know how long this jug is going to last. Perhaps it would only last one day. But just the fact that they found it after the focused effort of the Greeks to defile them all, this itself is worthy of a, this itself is a miracle and worthy of celebration of one day of, of, of one of, of at least one day of Hanukkah. But that's explanation number two. So again, explanation number one, the reason why it's an eight-day miracle, why it's an eight-day Yom Tov is to celebrate the military victory. Explanation number two, the reason why it's an eight-day Yom Tov, an eighth day to commemorate the miracle of the discovery of this jug of pure olive oil. I want, before I go to answer number three, I want to add one point to answer number two, to this idea that we're celebrating the miracle of the discovery of a pure jug of, of, a pure jug of olive oil. The Gemara explains that halachically, the Jews were allowed at that stage in history, when the story of Hanukkah happened, when the miracle of the story of Hanukkah happened, and the Greeks and the Jews were victorious over the Greeks and they chased them out of the base of Mikdash. Halachically, actually, they were permitted to light the menorah with impure olive oil. That's the halacha. If no pure olive oil is available, it's permissible to light the menorah with impure olive oil. It's called, the halachic term for this rule is called tumahut chabetzibur. Tumahut chabetzibur means if the, if, if, if there's no opportunity, if there's no practical ability to perform the services in the Beis HaMikdash in a state of purity, it may be done, it can be done, it's permitted to be done in a state of impurity. Yes, of course, ideally, all services in the temple in the Beis HaMikdash should be done in a state of tar, in a state of purity. And, and the Jews spared no effort to, 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 to do it as much as possible in a state of tar, in a state of purity. In fact, you know, the, the koyanim who did the service had to be in a state of purity. It's brought down in the Talmud that, that they, the, the mothers who gave birth to these koyanim wanted to make sure that they'd be pure from birth. And so they designed special caves where they could produce these, where they could give birth to these children, where they would be protected from any, from any impurity at all. We go to every length. The Jews did go to great lengths to assure that the services in the Beis HaMikdash were done in a state of purity. But what if we can't? What if circumstances beyond our control rob us of that ability? Or in the case of the story of Hanukkah, the Greeks enter the Beis HaMikdash and they defile all the oil. Actually, halachically in that case, it's permissible to light the menorah with impure oil. In truth, many explain, that's exactly what the Greek wanted. The Greeks wanted. The Greeks didn't mind if the Jews would light their menorah. They wanted to light, they want, they, the Greeks wanted the Jews to light the menorah with impure oil, which is the reason why they didn't destroy the oil. They didn't pour it out. They didn't, they didn't get rid of it. They left it there in the base of Mikdush in a state of impurity. If you pay attention, the Talmud doesn't say that they destroyed the oil. It just says that they defiled it and contaminated it. You see, the Greeks were, the Greeks were not there. The Greek, unlike the story of Purim, the Greeks were not trying to physically threaten the Jews. They didn't necessarily want to physically hurt them. This wasn't inherently a physical threat. Of course, when the Jews refused to comply with the Greeks, 
the Jews threatened them physically, of course. But inherently, the Jews didn't, the Greeks didn't want that. What did the Greeks want? The Greeks wanted to assimilate the Jews. They wanted them to, they wanted them to adapt. They wanted to secularize the Jewish people to a point where they would become just another nation like everybody else, symbolized by the impure oil. They said, you have a menorah, light the menorah. You, want, you need oil for the menorah? Put oil in the menorah, light it, gesundheit, no problem. But why does it have to be pure? The Greeks, the Greeks, of course, were the great philosophers. The Greeks worshipped intellect. They didn't mind the Jews embracing that part of Yiddishkeit, which makes sense. They waged war on that part of the, of the Jews that connected to the illogical part, to the, the, that connects to Hashem in ways that goes beyond logic. They said they didn't, they didn't, they, the, the Greeks wanted the Jews to be in a position where they'd have no choice and they'd have to light the menorah with impure oil. Instead, a miracle happened. And the Jews lit, the Jews discovered one jug of pure olive oil. A jug of oil that the Greeks did not defile because it was hidden somewhere in the floorboards of the temple that they couldn't find or that they didn't find, be it as it may. And a miracle happened and they found a pure jug. And the Jewish people said, we found a pure jug of oil. We're going to light the menorah with pure oil. They did not know at that time how long the oil was going to last. They did not know at that time that a miracle was going to take place and it was going to last them for eight days, long enough for them to bring new pure olive oil and that they'd never, God forbid, have to put impure oil into the menorah. They didn't know that at the time. All they knew was that they found pure olive oil. What it represented was the fact that the Greeks were unable to completely defile them and couldn't force them, couldn't put them in a position where they had to use impure oil to light them up. That's explanation number two. And then explanation number three, my favorite explanation. This one, if I remember correctly, comes from the Svasemis. The Svasemis says, this Hashem says now, he says, there's a greater miracle than that. Greater miracle than the military victory. And greater miracle than even the discovery of a pure jug of oil. Despite the Greeks' best attempt to defile every jug of oil in the base of Mictus, the Jews still, a miracle happened and they found the jug of oil. There was a greater miracle than that. And I'll, show, and I'll read it to you in the words of the Gemara. The Gemara says like this. <laughs> Excuse me. When the Greeks entered the temple, they defiled all the oil in the temple. When the royal family of the Chashmanoim overpowered, rose to power, and, overpower, and were victorious over the Greeks, quote, they searched and they found only one jug of oil that was lying there with the seal of the high priest. You can read it 10 times and you can gloss over the word. It says this, Fasemis, don't, don't miss the word. You know what the word is? The word that tells us the greatest story of the miracle of Hanukkah. The word is Bodku. Bodku means they searched. They searched. They went looking for pure olive oil. Ah, says the Svasanas. Before you go any further, before you read the rest of the story, before you read about the miracle of how they found, if they find a jug and they put it in the menorah and a miracle happens and it, and it burns for eight days instead of one until they're able to bring new oil, which is pure. Stop, 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 stop. Wait, wait, wait. Think about what the Gemara is saying. The Chashmanoim entered a temple that was completely defiled. It wasn't just the oil that the Greeks had defiled. It was the entire Beis Hamikdash. They put 
Rahman al-Islam, they put idols into the base of Mikdash. They had to clean it. They had to renovate it. They had to get rid of all the filth. They had to get rid of all, all, the, all the physical and spiritual filth that they had contaminated the base of Mikdash with. And they had to deal with the fact that the Greeks defiled every bit of oil that was found. And it was all, when it was all over and they knew exactly what the Greeks' agenda was, they went looking for a jug of pure olive oil. They went looking for it. Says the Svasemis, that's the miracle of Hanukkah. The fact that they went looking. Why is that so miraculous? They went looking, what's the big deal? He says the fact that they still believed that there was something to look for. The fact that they still had hope that there would be somewhere a jug of pure olive oil that they would find. The fact that they even thought to go looking for such a thing, that is the greatest miracle of Hanukkah. In a spiritual sense, I'll tell you what he's saying. What he's saying is, sometimes a person looks at a situation which seems completely destroyed. It seems like it's defiled. It seems like it's, it's experienced such a terrible breaking down. And you look at this and it doesn't even enter your mind to go and look for something left. There's nothing left. There's nothing left. We can reconstruct. In eight days, we can bring new oil. It'll take us some time. It'll take us, but, but it seems as if the destruction here is so complete that there's nothing to even look for. Sometimes people don't even think to go looking in the ruins. What are you looking for in the ruins? There's nothing here but ashes and defiled oil. Somehow, without anybody telling the Jews anything, they got it in their heads to go and look for pure olive oil. Why? Why were they even looking? Of course, once they looked, then the miracle unfolds. Then they find, and then it lasts for eight days instead of one day. And then we have a Yom Tov that we celebrate for 2,000 years later. Mazel Tov, the oil lasted. Mazel Tov, Hashem put a jug of oil there. Mazel Tov, a miracle happened that they found the jug. But whose idea was it to go looking? Whose idea was it to go looking through these ruins for a jug of pure, when the, when the Greeks did everything in their power to defile everything? Somebody in the time of Hanukkah, we don't know who, maybe it was the Hashmanoim themselves. Somebody in that time who lived through all that and saw all the destruction had such an unbreakable sense of optimism had such an unbelievable belief that Hashem was going to do a miracle that they even had the idea to go and look for a pure jug of oil. And from there, the entire story of Hanukkah ensues. That's the miracle that we celebrate on the first day of Hanukkah. The belief that they had after all they had been through that it was worthwhile for them to go looking for it. That's the greatest miracle. We don't look for things that we don't believe exist. We don't look for things when we think there's nothing to look for. We don't look for answers when we believe that there aren't answers. In fact, if we believe that there's no answer, we don't even ask questions. In a spiritual sense, what it represents is the ability of the Jew to never give up. No matter what he or she has been through, no matter the destruction, no matter the contamination, no matter, no matter, no matter what it is that they've seen, their ability to not give up and believe that there's something positive, there's something powerful, there's something there hidden inside the Jew, perhaps hidden really deep. There's a pure jug of olive oil buried there somewhere and I'm going to look for it and I'm going to find it. Or even if I don't find it, I'm going to go look for it. 
That searching for it comes from the deep-seated, unshakable confidence that there is still something there. I love the story. I believe I've shared it with you in the past. But I love the story about the Hasidic Jew who ends up in prison somewhere in Russia or Siberia. And he's sitting there in some prison cell surrounded by, you know, a bunch of goyim. And they're in prison all day, every day, all night, every night, bored out of their minds. And one day somebody manages to discover a pack of cards. And as the inmates sit around and they start playing with his cards, the Hasidic Jew says, I was sitting there thinking to myself, how silly is this? Sooner or later, the guards are going to come in and take the cards away. And sure enough, within a minute or two, a guard barges in, give me the cards. The Hasidic Jew says, I blinked and the cards disappeared. Gone. The guard leaves, the cards reappear. They continue playing. The guard come back, comes back in, the cards disappear again. He leaves, the cards reappear. He says it was like watching God creating the world from nothing into something. Eventually, the Hasidic Jew says, I pulled over one of the inmates and I said, where are you hiding these cards? The guards are looking everywhere. He says, we are expert pickpocketers. <laughs> Every time the guard walks into our cell to look for the cards, we take the entire pack and stick them right into the guard's coat pocket, into his own coat pocket. And as he leaves, we remove them and continue playing. It doesn't make a difference how many times the guard comes in here. He will never think, he will never think to stick his hand into his own pocket and search right there. He'll never think to look there. He'll look in everybody else's pockets. He'll look in everybody else's cubbies and in everybody else's drawer. He'll search under the floorboards and in the ceiling and in the windows and out the windows and everywhere. But not in my own coat pocket because I know what's in my own coat pocket and I know it's not there. They're safe, the inmate said. The cards are safe as long as we hide them in the guards' pockets. And the Hasidic Jew said, I never forgot that experience because of the lesson that it counts. And you know what it is? Many of us go through life looking. We're searching for all sorts of things. We're searching for answers. We're searching for happiness. We're searching for fulfillment. We're searching for, we're, we're searching for a million things. We're searching for Hashem. But very often we're searching in the wrong places. And we're missing the most obvious of places. Where's the most obvious of places? Inside ourselves, inside our, own coat, inside our own coat pocket. What if you already have the answer that you seek? What if you already know it? What if it's buried deep down in your own psyche and you have to go and look for it, but you're not looking for it because you don't believe it's there. It didn't even cross your mind to go searching inside yourself. This pure jug of olive oil that's lying in the floorboards of the temple signed with the, with the, signet, with the signature of the Kohen Godel. This represents the quality, the neshama of every single yid that cannot be defiled. No matter how many Greeks come and no matter how much oil they defile, a guy's influence on a Jew is limited. No matter how many times they seek to destroy us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Matzileinu Miyodam within every yid is a neshama. Within every yid, there's a piece of Hashem. And it's pure, and it's unadulterated. And the Koyan Godel himself has placed his stamp of approval upon it. If we search for it, we'll find it. But most of us don't bother searching. The Yetzer Hora tells us to give up. The Yetzer says, ah, you can't do it. It didn't happen yesterday. You tried last week, you tried last year. Forget about it. Just accept, just accept and move on. And so we stop searching. And when we stop searching, that's when we cut ourselves off from, the from all the miracles. 
One out of the eight days of Hanukkah is there to commemorate the greatest miracle of them all. The fact that the Jews didn't give up. The fact that the Jews didn't say, whatever, it is what it is. We'll do our best. Tomorrow's a new day. No! We won't give up. If there is a mitzvah to light the menorah, we will light it with pure olive oil. What pure olive oil? The Greeks defiled everything. We're going to look. You know, I have a feeling the Jew who decided he was going to go look for olive oil, probably his friends wrote him off as a Meshuggah. What are you looking? What, where are you looking? What, what, what are you looking for? He insisted. He believed. In a spiritual sense, sometimes a Jew goes through so much spiritual destruction you look at this Jew and you think, what in heaven's name could be inside this Jew? Don't give up. Don't give up on others and more, just as importantly or much more importantly, let's never give up on ourselves. As long as we search, we shall find. We shall find what it is that we seek. The miracle is not that we find it. The miracle is that we trust and that we believe enough to look for it. In education, educators often tell us that children need to be taught to ask questions. Crucial. Children need to be taught to ask questions. And the day you tell a child, don't ask questions, that's the day that you stifle the growth and the discovery of the child in a terrible way. The greatest, most empowering lesson to a student is ask questions and ask good questions and ask more questions every single day. Why is that so important? It's important because the subliminal message when you tell a student, ask a question. When you tell a student, pick up a shovel and go digging. When you tell somebody, look for something, what you're really telling them is, there's something to be discovered. What you're really telling them is that there are layers of truth within yourself that you will discover only if you go digging. So dig, so search. Don't become complacent. The day you tell a person, ah, stop asking questions. The day you tell a person to stop asking questions, that's the day you tell them there's nothing to look for. The miracle of Hanukkah happened because some Jew, I don't know his name, some Jew said, I'm never gonna stop asking questions. I'm never gonna stop looking. I'm never gonna stop. You, you can bring me whatever you want. You can bring me the entire Greek army. They can defile every bit of oil in the base of Mikdash. I'm still gonna keep searching. And he searched and he searched and he found. And who knows, perhaps when he found and he pulled out this little jug of oil from the floorboards of the base of Mikdash, perhaps the naysayer still laughed at him and said, that? What's that? <laughs> what are you so excited about? What did you find? A little jug of oil? It's only enough to last for one day. And that jug of oil burned not for one day, not for eight days, but for two and a half thousand years. And it's still burning in the home of every single year across the world that celebrates Hanukkah and lights the menorah. Be they religious or not yet religious, whether they know the story, whether they don't know the story, almost every Jew identifies with the Hanukkah lights. It's something about the Yiddish and the something about the Jewish soul that wakes up and says, this is my identity, this is me. It's something about the indestructible nature that stays with the Jews even long after, may Hashem protect us, the Beis HaMikdash is destroyed. And we no longer have a physical menorah in that sense. I think it's an incredibly illuminating and, and, and significant perspective we can do amazing things we can we can contribute in incredible ways as long as we don't give up as long as we're prepared to wake up tomorrow morning and keep searching and keep trying and keep looking and keep believing 
that there's what to look for. As long as we keep asking questions and keep searching, searching in ourselves, searching for the good in ourselves, searching for the good in others, searching for the ability to make this world a better place, even if all I can find right now is one tiny little jug of oil. How do you know how powerful the jug of oil is? At the time they found it, they had no idea. They didn't know what they were looking for. They didn't know what they found. They didn't know how long it would burn. They didn't know what was gonna happen the next day. But they knew they were searching for something. And Hashem gave them exactly what they were looking for. So this year, as we celebrate the Yom Tov of Hanukkah, you know, that this, there's an expression from the Hasidic rabbis. They say, when you light the menorah, you have to listen to the story that the, that the Hanukkah candles tell us. The story is one of Jewish survival and perseverance. The story is the story of the Yiddish and Neshama that's still burning two and a half thousand years later. The story is the story of an indestructible belief in a Yid and belief of a Yid. The story is the story of unconditional sources of strength within every single one of us, ready for us to be discovered if and when we find within ourselves, we discover within ourselves the strength to keep looking for more, to keep trying, and never to believe the naysayers who tell us to give up and it's enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. We can't, there is more to be discovered. There is deeper. We can, there's more juice. There's more beauty in life. There's more beauty in Yiddishkeit. There's more beauty for ourselves, for our children, for our families, for our neighbors. There's more within ourselves than we know. It's time for us to go looking for it. I want to wish you all a wonderful Yom Tov and a very happy Hanukkah. We should celebrate, please God, many simchas together, often and soon. L'chaim.